All right, now we just have an additional thing here. Yeah? It is about separating components. You know, at first we, we define the lease as the contract or part of a contract, right? So within a contract, you might find two, one, two, three, or even more lease leases. You might find a lease and a non-lease component, whatever. You read the question and find out for yourself, right? So what if maybe you have read a question and there is a lease? Part of it is a lease and part of it is not. How are you going to deal with it? That means you need to separate those two things and then deal with each one separately. Okay, so the same separating component comes into play here. Okay, now, a contract may contain a lease component and an analyst component that's normal or even more than one lease. Unless an entity chooses otherwise, the consideration in the contract should be allocated to each component based on the standalone selling price of each component. If anyone has they, they ever done FRS 15, you would get some, some, some issue here. You get something, some concept. When they say, uh, each component should be dealt with based on the standalone selling price. What do I mean by this? Maybe uh, let me give a, a little grasp of what uh, I mean, okay? I can do this, let me do this. Let's say uh, just a little thing. Let's say you have read a contract and maybe within that contract, the contract is worth $40 million, for example. But now you find out one thing, part of it is a lease, and part of it is a non-lease component. Now you ask yourself, oh, in reality, in case maybe it was only the part containing lease, it would have involved 25 million, for example. Maybe in case it was only the non-lease issue, maybe it would have involved how much? Maybe it would have involved uh, 40, how much? 55, let's say, 55 million, something like this. Now you say, how should I break down this 40 million so as to know what 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 amount to stay as lease and what amount not to stay as lease. What should we have done? Now, this is what we call standalone prices. When we deal standalone prices, uh, it's just you just deal the very easy manner, just sum them. 25 plus 55, you get a total of 80, right? Total of 80. So it's simple. You can just say that, oh, so as for the lease. The portion is 25 over 80. 20, 25 over 80 should be the total for the lease, profit for the lease. And then 55 over 80 should be the amount for the non lease component. So all you need to do is just take, take this fraction and multiply by, by 40. Here. So I'll take 25 over 80, you multiply by 40 to arrive at the first result. And then uh, you'd have to take 55 over 80. You also multiply by 40 to arrive at another result. So this is what you will have had to do. So here you would remain with 12.5, something like 12.5 million. And here would remain with something like 20, how much? 27.5, yes, something like that. And so you say that no, now I can deal with this portion as a lease and deal with the remaining as an analyst. Just like that. That's what we mean by separating. Ideally, that's what happens. Okay. The question says here uh, explanation says that entities can, if they prefer, choose to account for the lease and non lease component as a single lease. In case uh, you, may be, you may do that, that's why even the question we say, is said unless an entity chooses otherwise because an entity may just decide, decide to combine them is one thing. But if the entity decides to do so, this decision must be made for each class of the right of use asset. You might have you know, more than one right of use asset, so you have to decide, to decide for each class of right of use asset. Maybe if I've decided maybe for all properties to do this, I have to do for all properties. You do not choose this property, I do this, the other, I don't do that, no. That one will be selective decision, so you have to use it entirely for the full class if you decide to do that. And however, this choice would increase the lease liability recorded at the inception of the lease, which may negatively impact the perception of the entity's financial position. I hope you know about gearing. You know, a lease is a way of financing. 
if lease liability increases, even the gearing position would be worse. And if the gearing position is worse, maybe you might find yourself breach having breached the bank covenants, a lot of things. Maybe the interest coverage ratio may be very low, and that may may actually impair your maybe funding strategies, something like that. Okay, now uh, let's go direct to this illustration and take a look at how and what they really mean. Illustration number one. It says, on 1st January 2021, Switch entered into a contract to lease a crane for three years, okay? Switch entered into that contract. The lesser agrees to maintain the crane during the three-year period. So while Switch would be using, the lesser would be the one responsible uh, for maintaining that crane. The total contract cost is $180,000. That's the total contract cost. Switch must pay $60,000 each year with the payment commencing on 31st December 2021. Now you see the contract was entered into at the beginning of 2021, but the payment is made at the end of the year. So the payment is made in arrears, not in advance, right? So at the end of each year, commencing on 31st December, something like that, right? And it was for three years, no issue. Then it says, switch accounts for non lease components separately from leases. Now, the question uh, tells you specifically that you need to separate the lease and non lease components. You have to do that. Now, what would you have done? Okay, as it says, if you have to separate them, you need to know the separate standalone selling prices. And now they follow in the question and you are given them. We are told here that if contracted separately, it has been determined that the standalone price for the lease of the crane is 160000 and the standalone selling price for the maintenance services is 40000 You see this. This gives you a total of actually 200. Usually when you combine the items, actually the, the cost the, the cost a bit falls. It's like someone is offering two things at a time, so they have to offer the discount, right? That's why if you take 160 plus four, you have 200, which is beyond this one, which is 180, right? A bundle, a single bundle. Switch can borrow at the rate of 5% a year. We are not given the rate implicit in the real, so you have to use the incremental borrowing rate of 5% a year. Now, what are required to do here? What are required to do here are uh, required, explain how the above would be accounted for by switch in the year and the 31st December 20X1. So first and foremost, you have to break down this 180 into uh, what is related to the lease, but also what is related to the maintenance. Those two things, right? So it's just easy. You just have to add them up, as I told you before. Take 160 plus 40, you have 200, and then make further plans. Yeah. First of all, you'd have to take 160 plus 40, and you'll have 200. If you have 200, then just ask yourself, I have 200. How do I split that now? How do I split that 200? Because my main aim here is just to know uh, the amount to allocate. You have just have to remember one thing. Someone, someone tells you that, someone tells you that the, the contract, you have to pay a total of 180. Paying 60 year one, 60 year two, and 60 year three. But they are saying that they'll be maintaining that asset themselves. Now you ask yourself, hmm, these guys, are they really going to maintain this asset themselves? No. It's obviously that I've paid, I have implicitly compensated them for that. That's why they'll be doing that. So it's like I'm doing, I have the lease, but also there's an issue of maintenance here. So you need to break down this 60,000 into what is lease rental, but also what is for maintenance costs, right? That's what we need to do. That's why we just add, up, add, add the two things here. We had 160 plus 40, you have 200, and then you start 160 over 200 times 60,000 to obtain 48,000. And then for maintenance, maintenance alone was just 40,000. So you just take 40 over 200 times 60 again to arrive at 12,000. Why did we get this? Our main aim here 
was to break down that amount that seemed like live rental into what is really related to live rental, that is for 8,000, and what is really related to the maintenance service, that is 12,000. So until now, we are at peace. We really know the amount related to live and the amount related to maintenance, just like that. All right. So you can just go on here, just like we did before now, lease of the crane. So it's just easy, lease of the crane. You would have, a, we said that it's for three years, year one, year two, and year three. The cash flow now, instead of 60,000, would say for the 8,000 year one, for the 8,000 year two, and for the 8,000 year three, just like this. We are told that the amounts are paid at the end of the year. If they are paid at the end of the year, we say that you have to discount this is the end of the year, so you have to discount by one. That's one, one, 1.05 1 power one. Two years here, 1.05 power two, and there are three years, 1.05 power three, right? And then you have to multiply this. Anyway, most of times uh, it is preferred to put this in decimal. So if you have a calculator with you, I would prefer that you do this in decimal places, maybe to three decimal places or four decimal places. And then if you take the future cash flows here and multiply by the discount rate, you would remain with you would arrive at present value. So you have the present values. Then you add them up. You add your present values to arrive at 130,715. This one is the present value of the lease liability. There is nothing new here. We are now we're just making the revision. So this would be the initial carrying amount of the lease liability just like we did in the previous question. And if you need to proceed maybe to deal with subsequent treatment, I hope you know what to do. But first of all, we usually say that if you have the lease, you debit the right of use asset, and then you credit the lease liability. So first of all, you credit the lease liability, as you see here by that figure. And we said exactly the same figure should be added to the right of use asset here. So your double entry up to here is complete. In case there are direct costs, then that of the cost would be added to the right of use asset, but there was none. So up to here, you can just deal with the right of use asset separately, but also you can deal with the lease liability separately. We just needed to know how to, dist how to distinguish the lease and non-lease components, right? That was the main goal here. Now, maybe in case you decide to do like, what we did previously, yeah, you could have done it. You could have said this is the opening balance and maybe I pay for the 8,000 and maybe the rate implicit in the lease is 5%, just like this, you see. This was the opening balance, then 5%, then this opening balance, you have this figure, payment at the end of year one was for the 8,000, if you left, you arrive at this figure. Then you proceed for year two, for year three, depending on what the question needs you to do right, just like that. And everything uh, would have been over. And now suppose maybe you are told to deal with subsequent treatment of this right of use asset. What would you have done? It would have been the same, you know, because if you have the right of use asset here, we say it unless otherwise stated, just do the cost model, just depreciate it over the shorter of the use of life, in the lease team, right? And for the question, I think here we had we we only had information on the term of the lease, so uh, you could have just said this cost here over three years because there was no residual value, so it's like cost minus zero, which is a residual value over three years, and you arrive at this figure. The double entry of which we will charge depreciation and you reduce the right of use asset like this. So doing, uh, you arrive at the carrying amount of 87,143. Now, uh, you know, this case here was just about splitting that rent paid into the lease component and uh, the non-lease component. In our case here, the maintenance cost. So you'd know that, oh, so uh, for each year, for the eight, out of the 60,000 paid, for the 8,000 is paid for rent and 12,000 is paid for maintenance service. So 12,000 would be for year one maintenance, 12,000 again, year two maintenance and 12,000 again, year three maintenance. That's why if for maintenance service, since the amount would have been paid already, I would say 
debit expense in the income statement is, is 12,000 and then credit cash is 12,000. Just like that. Yeah, for year one, for year two, and for year three would have done exactly the same thing, right? Okay, so uh, that's what you really need to know when it comes to questions of this nature. You know, this is not a lead, this is a lead, and then you have to do something like that. Oh, in case maybe you have something, this is just a question. Of course, you won't normally encounter questions like this. The question, speaking of reassessing the lead liability, it's rare, but it's not, still it's not bad. You can just go through it. You can just go through it and find out what you need to do. Reassessing the lease liability. You know, uh, if you remember, do you remember yesterday, we said that the lease liability can be based on fixed payments. It can be based on variable elements. Let's say on options, you expect to extend the lease term. So if you expect to extend, that means you will pay more. And so you will increase that. Okay? Now, let's say, you know, you forecast maybe five years later, you see that you are going to pay and then you put that additional rent to be paid. But when time progresses, you, you, you find out that, oh, I will not extend the lease. So you have to remove that. So how do you reassess the lease liability? Because in that case, we would need to reassess computation of our lease liability, right? Maybe I take you back here, you know, I like to do this. It's better that I take you back here to see what we are actually doing. You see this. We say that these are the components of the lease liability. There may be fixed payment, variable payment, amounts expected to be payable under residual value guarantees. You have guaranteed the lesser that, oh, give me your assets. I guarantee that by the end of three years, at which point I would have used, I would have finished my job, this asset would, would, wouldn't be worth less than maybe $10 million, but the asset is maybe expected to be only $7 million. That means, you have guaranteed to pay that extra amount of $3 million. Maybe at initially you saw that, and maybe after, after a long time, after time forward, you find out that, oh no, the value won't be $7 million. Maybe it will be much higher, it will be lower. So you find out that even that lease liability has to be revised. Just very normal things. Because as again, I'm repeating, when we do the initial measurement, you have to project, you have to forecast the future and the future is uncertain. So matters might change for better or for worse, right? So you have to know uh, that might encounter things like that. That's why they are saying reassessing the lease liability. So don't be surprised at all in case we encounter something like this in an exam. Okay, so they say uh, a corresponding adjustment is posted against the carrying amount of the right of use asset. It's obvious you also have to involve the right of use asset because you have to remember one thing. <laughs> Whenever we are increasing uh, the lease liability. Hi, sorry, Fred. Yes, yes. I just noticed we have remained two of us. Two of us? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for one time, okay, let me pause. Let, let me stop first. 